much, everyone. Um, that was a lovely introduction. Um, and music and dancing, what could be better? Uh, I enjoy and love both, and they are hard acts to follow, um, for sure. Um, it is my privilege to be here today, and I thank the John Dewey uh, School for Children, as well as Partnerships for Sustainability Education, um, in uh, the opportunity to participate in this really, really important discussion. Um, I would like to uh, share my screen, but unfortunately at this point it's disabled. Is, can, can it be opened up so that I can share that, my PowerPoint? Ah, excellent, thank you. Terrific. So I'm gonna to talk today about sustainability um, in a slightly different way. I'm gonna talk about sustainable learning. Um, and I'm going to start my presentation the way all of us have because uh, the crisis that we, are, that we have experienced over the past year and that we are continuing to undergo, of course, is very much in the front of our minds. Um, however, um, crisis can have its benefits. Um, and it does allow us um, to break through some intractable or cemented ideas or practices. And in fact, the crisis that we have experienced globally has also galvanized global conversations around some central issues. And I wanna talk a little bit about four of them that have sort of preoccupied uh, conversations around education uh, for quite some time and even more so during this time. Let me just spend um, a few moments on each and in each discussion to kind of talk about some of the tensions and contradictions that are contained um, within each um, issue. The first, of course, is the whole notion of learning loss. Um, and it is not um, news to any educator. All of us are very concerned about the impact of extended school closings um, on our students um, and on family, society, and teachers. Um, the, you know, McKinsey has done um, a survey looking at learning loss and has come to the conclusion, not a surprise, that learning loss is a global and significant phenomenon. And in fact, you know, they put um, uh, sort of a number on the amount of learning loss. They peg it at five to 12 months with poor and minoritized children, as you can imagine, sitting, you know, sort of higher up or further along um, that continuum of time. UNICEF um, has recently conducted a survey of 164 nations, and, you know, as they think about uh, learning losses and reopening schools, and their, their study, you know, tells us that 70% of these countries are going to be focusing on recovering lost learning time. And how you recover time, well, um, some of the strategies are going to be um, longer school days, um, shorter summer breaks, um, and certainly a great deal of remediation built into the curriculum. And OECD, of course, we all know it um, as a, a key sort of international force, particularly around education, that is constantly focused on the relationship, you know, between education and the economy. They, su you know, suggest that because of these learning losses, that um, economically GDP will be lower at 1.5% for the rest of the century. That's for the next 79 years. So we are talking about, you know, pretty dire consequences um, according to one perspective. However, um, there is some challenging uh, of this idea of learning loss, and I'm, I would include myself um, in that group. So I'll start this conversation with a quote from Rachel Gabriel, who is um, a scholar um, in the US. And she says, learning is never lost, though it may not always be found on pre-written tests of pre-specified knowledge or pre-existing measures of pre-coronavirus notions of achievement. So what, is she, what she is suggesting is that how we measure learning depends on the instruments that we use to measure it and the definition that we have um, of learning itself. In fact, there is a recent research, it actually just came out last month in April, that's um, indicating 
that students are actually starting to rebound from um, academic setbacks at rates and levels um, that are surprising um, to educators. The next issue, of course, that is animating discussions around the world is around um, machine learning, uh, technology, uh, digitalization of education, um, and um, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and, you know, talk about sort of making cement move. The pandemic caused us to break through that cement ceiling of moving from face to face uh, to online and virtual uh, teaching um, in a huge hurry. And many folks who would never have imagined, many teachers would never have imagined that they would be teaching online pretty much all the time, suddenly found themselves doing it. But the question is, um, how well did we do this? Um, I think there's unfortunately too much evidence that we sort of just transported what we do in face-to-face -face environments to um, an on-learning or virtual environment. And so uh, there ended up being a little too much talking and telling um, and pouring of content um, into students as opposed to thinking differently about online pedagogies. We all know as teachers that the heart of good learning and teaching is never the tools. And therefore the heart of good digital learning, of course, is not about the technological. And yet we continue, I think, to focus too much on the tools rather than the tool makers or the folks who are implementing um, the tools. A third issue is teachers. And of course, teachers, um, they've always been at the top of the discussion around educational change um, and the future. But during the pandemic, teachers were definitely um, put in a very, very different light. And all of a sudden, uh, millions of, of, of people around the world, parents, families, policymakers, anyone who had children, anyone who's engaged with schools, suddenly realized how difficult um, the job of a teacher is. And so teachers were held up as sort of paragons um, of, you know, sort of community goodness. At the same time, teachers were also demonized. Um, when teachers were concerned about going back to school, uh, they were concerned for their own safety and for the safety of their students. Um, there was a lot of criticism of teachers. Um, and there is also a lot of pressure um, on teachers um, to be able to sort of produce and deliver um, in the same ways, um, even though we have been obviously in a very, very different um, reality. In the middle of this discussion um, is uh, a lot of conversation about what teachers need to know um, as a consequence of the experience that we've gone through, but also um, as we look towards the future. And there are you know, some tensions and disagreements about what the focus of continuing professional development for teachers should be. And I've listed just a few of these um, and they are not sort of um, uniquely discreet but at the same time, where we place our resources, our energy, our focus and our time will make a great deal of difference um, for students. So should we pay more attention to you know, academic learning, uh, given the fact that we are so concerned about learning loss, but we also know that social distancing has um, created lots of issues for young people who have been separated from their friends, from the school community and, and from sort of social interactions uh, with others so that social emotional learning, wellness um, and mental health have become um, paramount. Regardless of where you sit on the, you know, these sides of the fence, the reality also is that teachers all over the world are being asked to do more and more with now less and less because of the sort of financial impact of uh, the pandemic. So that I think is a very serious consideration for all of us. And finally, um, an issue that is, you know, resonating around the world is this notion of the future. Um, what will the new normal be? Um, how can we sort of manage the uncertainty? Um, where are we going as a world and a society? 
there are so many ways um, as um, you know, Principal uh, uh, Razo uh, so eloquently said earlier that we have um, shot ourselves in the foot um, and have created you know, an unsustainable future um, if we don't change our behaviors uh, very quickly. And yet it, it is sort of iron, uh, ironic that in the middle of talking about the uncertain future, we are also trying to control it and trying to predict it. So for instance, um, when I think about uh, McKinsey again, so McKinsey predicts that the current cohort because of all the learning loss um, will lose out on 60 to $80,000 worth of lifetime earning. And the World Bank says that $10 trillion will be lost uh, due to lower learning and to dropouts. And my question is, lower learning about what? What kinds of jobs will folks be working that they will, you know, sort of have this, this, this income gap um, that McKinsey is talking about? It is sort of um, problematic that we insist on predicting a future that we keep saying is unknown. And on top of all this, layered over it, under it, and throughout it is the issue of inequity, oppression, and justice, uh, or injustice. Um, that we know millions of children and people around the world do not get the support, basic, uh, basic needs met, education, um, respect uh, that they deserve. Um, that they live on the margins and they live under oppression. Um, the pandemic has um, brought those issues um, into relief um, in a way that uh, all of us are completely aware of um, the inequitable divides that are in our society. But there is a question of whether or not we will move beyond the rhetoric of, oh my goodness, isn't that terrible? to making change because these issues of injustice have been in place for a very, very long time. So the thing that we have to be worried about is the status quo. It has, as Michael Fullan says, a gravitational pull that works against change. And the last song that we heard about change really resonates uh, with this comment. We are in a moment of great possibilities. So much has happened and there is indeed great momentum for change, but there is also a powerful yearning for life before COVID and a lack of acknowledgement that we may simply never get back to where we were. So today I wanna to talk about sustainable learning to move us away from sustainable teaching. If you think about the four issues that I just, you know, sort of outlined, um, all of them are focused on, on sort of sustaining what is already in place. And that has not served everyone well. Thinking about learning loss according to, you know, traditional and current metrics and definitions of achievement. Thinking about, you know, teacher PD um, in the context of technology and online, um, thinking about the future in terms of money that's gonna be lost as a result of kids being out of school simply will keep us where we are. But sustainable learning shifts our attention um, from teaching to kids, um, from the teacher to the student. We have been working hard to sustain teaching that we have in place but I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what it would look like to sustain learning and to shift our focus. Of course, in that conversation, I'm gonna focus on the themes of this session, the what of learning, the, the where of learning and the how of learning. And to do that, I'm going to ask my friend, Rebecca Stanton, um, who is a teacher in New York City um, to help me tell this story. So this is Rebecca's story. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Rebecca. Uh, she is a master teacher and I do not use that term lightly. Um, she is a brilliant, brilliant educator. She has been working for 25 years and counting uh, with immigrant youth um, and their community. Yep. She is um, uh, a teacher of English language arts um, as well as a teacher of English 
as a second or new language. Um, and she has recently taken her, uh, herself back to school to get a credential as a reading specialist because she began to see sort of the intersection of uh, newcomers uh, joining her classroom, um, their language learning uh, needs, um, but also needs around um, particular reading uh, barriers. Um, and because there's no reading specialist in her school, she said, well, I guess I need to be it. She works at a school that we all call CHA, and CHA stands for uh, Community Health Academy of the Heights um, in New York City. It is um, a school uh, in um, uh, uh, certainly not an advantaged community at all and, and is considered high need uh, because it works with uh, students, receive students who, um, you know, evidence, you know, multiple vulnerabilities um, and uh, one of which um, is poverty. Uh, Rebecca works always with newcomers. And in fact, she works with the new newcomers um, who joined her school. Um, and you can see just from the slide in 2017, who her students constituted. They come from uh, different countries. They bring with them all kinds of experiences, uh, some of which are traumatic, uh, all of which are challenging. Um, and they come with different levels of um, schooling, experience, um, language, um, et cetera. The, what is very noteworthy about uh, Rebecca and her students is that they consistently achieve above the norm. And this is on those traditional um, assessments uh, that I talked about earlier. Um, in New York State, uh, students have to, they don't have to, they can choose to um, uh, pass uh, what's called the Regents, which is a high school leaving examination. And it's, it's challenging uh, to achieve a Regents pass um, uh, and her students consistently perform um, above the norm, uh, even compared uh, to those who uh, speak uh, English um, as a home language. But the achievement is not simply on tests. I think that is very, very important uh, to underscore that her students achieve in terms of their uh, engagement with the world and their activism, in terms of the authentic writing um, that they do, in terms of the deep dialogues that they um, have with one another and with teachers, the inquiries that they, they um, uh, initiate and the performances, not in sort of a, um, you know, a concert kind of performance sense, but the public performances they give in terms of sharing their work um, with others um, in the community. So looking at Rebecca's work, I thought about the, the what, the how, and the where um, to say, how does sustainability, uh, sustainable learning look if we change the what? In Rebecca's case, the what always begins with students. It always begins, and this is a, you know, a language from Rebecca herself, what is important to them, what interests them, uh, what gives them a purpose for learning, because this is what engages students. When students have purpose, they are more willing to spend time and the work honing their understanding, improving their drafts, and working on their fluency. The part about or the common practice about around what students should learn too often in sustainable teaching comes from the outside. We tell students what they should learn. In Rebecca's case, sustainable learning starts from the inside of students, what they internally care about. But just identifying, you know, sort of a meaningful what is not enough. The how um, is equally important. And for sustainable learning, the how depends, um, in Rebecca's case, uh, on, on sort of two different ways of looking at, at learning. So one is a, a way of looking at students themselves. And Rebecca always begins, always perceives her students as thinkers who have powerful ideas. She says that, um, they have, you know, they are thinking about the world and they have lots of important things that they have to say. She also sees them as invested learners. And in fact, uh, tells a story about students wanting to come to her class 
after school to spend time working on drafts that they were getting ready to present um, to uh, members in the community um, outside their school. But the how is also the way in which um, learning is organized and structured. And even though Rebecca as a teacher obviously has a structure in mind and she says, I have to keep the standards um, in front of me um, as we, my students and I co-create curriculum together. So she says she looks to her students to help her develop the curriculum that they're going to engage with in class. She says they are invited to be part of the curriculum development, invited into the design of the classroom. And she believes that strongly because in order to be invested learners and to be thinkers with powerful ideas who have voice, um, you have to be a member of a strong community. And this is one uh, comment on the strong community that students themselves develop. Our learning community is interconnected. When we support and encourage each other, we all learn better and grow as learners. And finally is the issue of where, you know, where does sustainable learning happen? And for Rebecca's students, it happens out in the world. Um, you cannot work on things that matter to you and not be engaged with uh, space and time and people outside your classroom. So uh, here is um, a picture of their participation in the People's Climate March in Washington, DC in 2017. And it's, you know, the, the converse, you know, it's very appropriate example for today's conference because the students themselves had questions and concerns. And so they raised issues of climate change. They raised issue of immigration they raised issues of equity, of food security and insecurity. Those are the things that they wanted to study. And this field trip is not simply, you know, a, a sort of ad hoc trip that one does over a weekend, but is embedded um, within um, a full and holistic examination of climate change that is, um, you know, a, a sort of concerted effort between Rebecca and her students. Here are students presenting their teen advocacy projects um, at Teachers College Columbia University um, with which uh, Rebecca partners um, and has been a partner for many, many years. Um, and so students have, you know, sort of authentic, um, legitimate um, and informed audiences to talk to about their work. And so when you have a real purpose for sharing what you do and you know that folks are going to take seriously your work, um, there is a great deal of reason to be motivated um, about doing it. And finally, um, and there are many, many examples, these are only three, um, every summer uh, students participate in a citizen scientist um, project. Um, this is an intensive program that brings together a couple of universities and NGO, students from high schools, of course, experienced teachers from several uh, New York City public schools, um, as well as pre-service students and new teachers, and in fact, um, uh, our friend uh, in the hat is um, a new teacher. Um, uh, I think he might've been in his second year of teaching at the time. But what these students do is work with scientists um, and a local uh, river project um, collecting data on the health of rivers. Um, and going back to this notion of doing authentic and meaningful work, the data that they collect actually is used by um, the, 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 the river keepers uh, project um, and students have presented you know, to city council members what they've learned about um, improving water quality and about sustainability. So if I were to characterize um, Rebecca as a teacher who I feel engages in this notion of sustainable learning, um, what are some ways in which or characteristics that she brings to this? Um, I think the first is that she brings an equitable mindset, which means that she sees her students as if they're on the brink of greatness. And this is without question. She sees them as the glass, glass that is half full, that is, that is full of capacity and potential, but it comes with um, a sort of you know, warm demands for students to do their best and to do better. Um, and she provides those supports, but her expectations are that they can always do because of their capability. The second is the 
the, the use of empowering pedagogies. Um, and in Rebecca's case, I, I will name, you know, sort of four things that I think have meaning for sustainable learning. What matters is the curriculum, not as it's quite often defined, i.e. in content terms, but as it's defined in um, a holistic experience that actually has relevance and meaning for um, the students who are participating in it versus receiving it. We quite often think about curriculum delivery as if it's you know fast food where you just kind of plunk something down and, and kids gobble it up. Curriculum is developed, created, evolves um, through participation. Um, and that is what matters um, in sustainable learning. You can learn skills through anything. So why not learn skills through what matters to you, what matters to students, what is um, you know, important um, in their lives. I've talked a little bit about authentic purposes and audiences. So much better to write a project that you know someone you know who cares about what you have to say is going to listen to rather than writing a research project that uh, or a paper that gets a grade and goes you know gets stuck in a portfolio. And finally, the whole notion of the community of learners and that community actually extends beyond Rebecca's classroom. If you were to walk into her classroom today she would immediately invite you to be part of that learning community and to support her students with in whatever way and with whatever talent um, that you have. The last is that sustainable learning um, comes from love. And I will, um, Rebecca loves her, her, her students, um, but not in sort of a modeling sense, but in the sense of great and deep care, deep respect, uh, with deep understanding that the future of the world depends on them. But I will borrow from my friend B.C. Fenimore, who many years ago wrote a handout where she listed 10 ways to treat all kids like rich kids, because unfortunately, kids who are poor quite often are not treated as nicely as kids who are not. And I'll just share the first, which is, B.C. says, Make sure that you speak to, connect with every student in your classroom every single day. Make sure that they know that they're noticed and they matter um, and that you see them. Because there are many kids going through school year after year, day after day, hardly being noticed, um, hardly having interaction with important others. So just a couple of things to finish um, my talk and that is, when we think about sustainable learning, we think we have to, I think, consider what are central animating forces in, in our work. Um, equity has to be uh, very much at the center. And we have not, um, as a sort of world education community, focused on equity. We have focused on compensation. We have focused on um, filling gaps. We have focused on trying to level the playing field through you know, resource distribution, and those are the good examples. But in many cases, we have actually neglected children um, and um, ensured and perpetuated actually um, inequitable practices. The second is that we need to reclaim not what counts, we are doing too much counting in education, but what matters. Um, and again, what matters has to be connected to what our young people care about. We have to think about preparedness for whose world. Um, it is, as I said, ironic that we keep talking about being prepared for a future that is uncertain. What we need to be talking about is helping young people think about the future that they want and how they can get there. The future that would be you know, welcoming, uh, sustainable um, and um, happy, wonderful for everyone. And finally, we have to be very cautious about evidence. So much evidence is used for the wrong reasons or by folks who are not um, directly associated with students. Um, so we need to ask lots of questions um, about this evidence, who's created it, and what purpose it's being used for. When I think about sustainable teaching, um, I think part of the reason why we have been stuck in this place is that we've been focused on teaching something, teaching about something, our focus on content, content, content. So our teaching what and teaching how have been actually very, very narrow. 
This is a dead idea. And it's a dead idea that whose time has long been done. What we need to be focused on is teaching someone, teaching a person, teaching learning that has meaning for a human being, teaching for something as opposed to teaching about something. So in closing, when I think about how in our search for what's missing in order to get to sustainable um, learning, we have to think about what, but we also have to think about who. Who comes before what? We have to think about why, not just how. The purpose of schooling, and the purpose of schooling was never, should never be about getting high test scores, high ranks, um, you know, good QS numbers, PISA scores, or, you know, a paycheck. And in terms of where learning should happen, well, absolutely, it should happen everywhere. It does happen everywhere. It's just that we miss the opportunity to connect that everywhere learning uh, with the learning that we think only happens um, in the classroom. So thank you so much um, to everyone. Appreciate uh, your kind attention. And of course, appreciate the opportunity to be here um, in today's discussion. Thank you for such valuable insights, Professor Aileen Goodwin. We were able to learn about a lot about uh, what is sustainable learning, some benefits of the crisis. We must reclaim not what counts, but what matters. We shouldn't just teach about something. We must teach about what and how. At this point, Professor Goodwin will be giving us a few minutes of her time to take in some reactions or questions from our audience. Kindly feel free to send in your questions in the chat box. So I see um, a couple of questions that I can answer. Um, so one question is about Hong Kong and the dominant mode of teaching um, still. Hong Kong has been um, in a period of um, educational reform um, for 20 years. Um, and I think in general, the movement has been from um, teacher-centered to learner focus. Um, uh, it has been from sort of uh, discrete subject knowledge to um, looking at learners more holistically and thinking about whole person um, development. However, um, the distance between um, goal or intention um, and result or action is always a challenge. Um, and so uh, I would say that in Hong Kong, um, probably if I were to make a gross generalization that we still have a tendency to focus far too much um, on sort of content knowledge um, and the delivering um, of content. Um, and a lot of, you know, much of learning is driven um, by the DSC exams. They are the end of uh, school, high school uh, leaving examinations because those test scores um, uh, sort of dictate um, whether or not you'll get into university, what area in university or field of study you can enter, um, and which university, what quality university uh, you might um, have access to. So as long as we continue to shape achievement in certain ways, it is um, very, very hard to change teaching um, because goals are fixed in some sense. So Rebecca's example shows us that you can focus on those kinds of external um, measurements, but at the same time engage in sustainable learning that places students at the center. But it is not easy. Um, and she is certainly someone who has been doing it for a very long time. Um, so I think one thing we need to learn as educators is how to do both things. Um, as I said you know, earlier, um, you can learn skills in all kinds of ways. Um, so why not in learn, learn skills embedded um, authentically in important questions that matter um, to our world? So um, has COVID made the situation for teaching and learning better or worse? Um, hmm. 
I think COVID has um, presented many challenges um, to us, um, but, um, uh, and there's actually quite a bit of evidence coming out um, that learning has been, you know, going back to the conversation about learning loss, that there have actually been a lot of gains um, by students, um, gains that are not measured by tests, uh, gains around um, time management, uh, resilience, um, independence, um, you know, the kinds of things that uh, young people were doing to support and help, you know, their families. Um, so uh, it, you know, to say it make it better or worse, um, there were some parts that were very, very challenging. But I think overall, I'm not sure that COVID, um, COVID has the, I will say this, COVID has the possibility of making teaching and learning much, much better because it has been, you know, sort of that force that has broken the cement. The question is, um, will we just pave it over and move on? Because as things start to kind of revert to things, to ways that are more recognizable, as we go back to schools, um, are we going to place kids again in those classrooms at those desks listening to teachers? Um, are we going to revert sort of to our old behaviors? Um, and it's connected to another question around, you know, schools and focusing on high grades um, and their social reputation um, as opposed to, you know, collaborative, sustainable education and well-being of their students. Um, it is it is connected to um, social values. It's connected to uh, power um, and you know, who is making decisions um, about schools and for schools. Um, it's associated with um, families and communities. Um, you know, there's a lot of press in Hong Kong, for instance, where families want to see worksheets and lots of homework. Um, they want to hear you know, that the, uh, what's being taught is about subject um, because their own experiences of learning uh, tell them that what that is what learning is. So then, um, you know, going back to um, the whole notion that was discussed this morning about a world uh, community and global collaboration, I saw a figure recently that there are 72 million teachers in the world. What if 72 million teachers were, even if, what if half of those, what if one quarter of that number work together um, in order to push back against, um, you know, what is commonly thought of as important in schools to, you know, revise, you know, that thinking, um, to demonstrate through evidence that teachers have all the time of sustainable learning um, that is meaningful. Where stories like Rebecca's can be told over and over again not just in, in, in sort of discrete conversations like this one, but at an international level, because we all know there are millions of teachers who know how to do this. We need to be learning from them. Um, current political climates, yeah, that is an interesting uh, conversation. So let me go back to this question of, um, how do you think we can get to know what is important to the learner? Um, students, teachers, stakeholders, society, research. Um, well, pretty much you start by asking. Um, we don't do enough asking um, of students. Um, we do too much telling. Um, we have a curriculum that is fixed. We have ideas about what needs to be learned first and what needs to be learned next. Um, it is hard for us to think about uh, both and so that we're doing things simultaneously. It is, um, if you think about some kids, who are um, labeled, uh, you know, sort of uh, slow progress learners. Um, they are constantly relegated to a boring diet of basic skills because the assumption is that you need those skills as building blocks to do more exciting things. I'm not suggesting for a second that skills are not important or basic skills are not important. Of course they are, but I'll go back to what I said before. You can learn basic skills in a drill and kill kind of way, or you can learn basic skills as part of, um, you know, curriculum learning projects uh, that are connected to what is important to you. Um, 
I don't have the opportunity to talk to young people enough. Um, I certainly don't have the opportunities I had as uh, when I was a teacher. Um, but there's never been a time when uh, kids didn't have lots of ideas about what they wanted to know and questions about things. Um, but the part of the problem is that we um, don't listen or don't provide that space for asking. Sir Ken Robinson, who's done a lot of work um, uh, on sort of creativity um, and unfortunately passed away uh, just last year, if I have it correct, um, prematurely. Um, amazing work, you know, around, um, you know, uh, learner-centered um, education, around engaging schools and around creativity. And he uh, says, said um, very, very clearly that in schools, um, we kill creativity. Um, if you think about young people coming to school, young people come ready to learn. Um, young children are curious. Um, uh, folks talk about young children not being able to you know, focus. Um, all of you have seen four and five-year-olds really hunker down into something and spend tons of time on a project that they want to do. I have uh, young people outside my um, uh, apartment building uh, who uh, practice um, skateboarding endlessly every single day. They fall, they don't do it right, um, but they spend hours on that practice because they care about it. Young people, students will care about, will, will spend the time on stuff that they care about. So our job as teachers is to think about, to find out what they care about. Um, oof, why is it that great? Okay, how can the usual subjects in schools including engage what's important to the students? Um, well, I'll go back to, you know, Rebecca as an example. Um, so Rebecca asked her students, what do you want to learn about? What matters to you? What are your ideas about the world? And they come out with issues like climate change, you know, immigration law, um, you know, the Dreamers uh, Act. I mean, all those, and this of course is in, in the US. Um, um, those are simply topics. Um, then Rebecca uses those for students to learn about what they're supposed to learn about. Um, so one of the important skills on um, standardized tests is argumentation. Um, well, isn't it kind of uh, uh, almost unnatural uh, to think about developing your argumentation skills um, around controversial issues uh, such as climate change where there are lots of different opinions, lots of different practices, lots of different issues. Um, it, is, uh, it is when I think we provide um, and open spaces for complex um, education and complex curriculum that um, we um, create platforms that lend themselves to the typical subjects. You know, if you talk about climate change, you can look at history, you can look at mathematics, you can look at science, you can look certainly at all kinds of social issues. You are reading, you are writing, you are debating, you are doing artwork. I mean, all those things can be uh, contained within those important topics. But we are accustomed to doing things separately and discreetly, not having connections to a bigger picture. Um, that is where we need to be better um, as teachers. And it is not um, a mystery. It's actually, um, it's not that it's easy, but it's not, it's certainly not that hard. So I think that is when we think about continuing professional development, uh, teachers learning how to do that and learning together to do that is where the answer lies. Um, when the pandemic is over, would you still recommend the conduct of online learning instead of face-to-face -face teaching? Again, um, I would say that, you know, it, it shouldn't be an either or. If we're focused on learning, then we're focused on the kind of teaching that serves the learning we want. And it may be that for certain kinds of learning, um, online is best. And for other kinds of learning, face-to-face um, -face is best. And for other kinds of learning, independent, self-regulated learning is best. Um, 
But to say, well, pandemic's over, let's just all go back to class. Um, that is the worry that we will go back to just the way things were. Um, um, because, and, and focus on the delivery, the teaching, um, as opposed to focusing on learning um, and the learner. So I would hope that we don't simply go back to what was, um, that we will use this experience, um, which has shaken us all uh, to continue to feel that sort of internal dynamic movement uh, towards something that's different and better. Um, so there's a question about work being hard uh, for me uh, since this pandemic has started. Um, and I would say that work has been hard for everyone, um, uh, partly because what we have learned is even in the transportation of face-to-face -to, -face to online, um, it, it doesn't just happen magically. Um, it's not the best thing to do, but um, it is actually not simple. Um, what we have learned that, um, you know, staring at a screen for many hours at a, at a time um, is even if it's, you know, you stare at a screen for an hour, it feels like more time than, you know, looking at a teacher for an hour in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, we, you know, we have learned that um, the way in which we spend our time with others is far more valuable than we ever knew. Um, and we've learned that um, the pandemic has created a whole new set um, of issues and problems um, as any change um, would. Uh, so I, I think, you know, we, we, we must congratulate ourselves because we have, um, we have picked up, we have changed, we have moved, we have experimented, we have fallen down, we've done lots of things. Um, so it's, it's, we have done absolutely the very best that we can. But um, what we need to do then is um, to not kind of have a big sigh of relief when everything is over and who knows when that will be. Um, but as I said, to take the opportunity of um, this moment. Um, yeah, the, the, I, I'll add, you know, um, to that uh, uh, response, uh, the sort of um, flip classroom approach. Um, and I will say that um, I think the flip classroom approach is um, very useful and helpful, um, but I do not believe that we have fully developed or utilized it uh, to the extent that we could. And so quite often, um, or too often perhaps, um, the flipped classroom becomes an opportunity to basically lecture online, uh, you know, asynchronously, and then to lecture again uh, when students come uh, to you um, on, on screen. So um, when, so in, in, in finishing, I guess, um, this, uh, this conversation, let me just choose one last question. Um, okay. There's a question about political climate in countries affecting education, and it says, how could? Um, and my answer would be, how does it not? Um, political climate affects everything. Um, and certainly, um, education ends up being either uh, the whipping post, um, things are wrong because you educators didn't teach properly, didn't teach the right things. Um, or uh, they end up being the savior. Everything will be okay if you know, we do the right kind of teaching or learning. Um, so again, going back to that world community of educators, we need to work in solidarity because we are neither devils nor saints. We are part of the ecosystem uh, of education. Um, and, and too much of that ecosystem is disturbed by forces um, outside schools and classrooms where, you know, teaching and learning actually occur. Um, and we are quite often too busy um, uh, sort of following, responding to the mandates. Um, let's try and be actors um, in this as well. You know, um, activist educators um, for the benefit um, of our students. The education is used as a political pawn um, to gain votes, to sell property, um, to do all kinds of things. Um, 
we need to resist that. Um, so education is always political. The question is uh, what political aims uh, should it serve? Um, and I would suggest that perhaps the ones it is serving now are not the ones that we would put first um, on the list. So thank you again, everyone for um, your kind attention, your really great questions. Um, I could talk on and on, uh, but I, as I said, I do know that there are, uh, there's a full program and other speakers. Um, it has been really a pleasure um, to be part of this conversation. Um, I do wish you a wonderful uh, two days. Uh, the start of it has already been uh, so sort of, um, not just enlightening, um, but also um, heartening in the heartfelt sense. Thank you.